All right, so I just got my first graph theory exam back. Um, I'm gonna leave a lot of room over here so that I can post the questions as I talk about them. Just as kind of an aside, um, graph theory, more so than topology I'm finding, is extremely vocab and definition heavy. Uh, and that's what most of this stack consists of. And we're, what, five weeks in? This is probably 40 cards. I mean, this is both graph theory and topology, but. Most of it is graph theory. Luckily, if you're good with managing definitions and memorizing them, however you choose to do that, graph theory can be pretty easy to deal with and, and learn and succeed at. My exam was out of 100 points, and I had the option of skipping two problems, which I did just for the sake of time because I'm a slow math doer, and especially when it comes to proofs, which some of these can, uh, consists of, and I was able to skip up to two without a loss of points. I didn't want to put effort into something just for it to be wrong. So I played my cards and skipped the more complicated and lengthy proofs. I ended up getting a 74, which I didn't think was bad. I'd like to get an A next time, which I think will be doable. So let's just jump into it. All right, so page one, I'm gonna throw all these up on the screen. Here you go. So consider the following graph. Don't need to justify answers. Um, so we're finding, we're determining whether or not vertex sequences are trails, paths, uh, that consists of the first three problems. So that's just an application of the definition of a trail. Next one we got, is this vertex sequence a path? Another application of a definition. Same thing with part D, what is the big delta of G? So the maximum degree value found. Same thing with the degree sequence. That's just numbering the degrees from greatest to smallest in the graph and how many connected components it has, uh, which I got wrong, and find a cut vertex. So all of these are just application of definitions. Pretty straightforward stuff. This next page uh, has uh, a little bit more to it. There is some definition as well, but it's a lot easier to get tripped up on ones like these. Part A, find a set of verti vertices such that the graph induced by S and G is also isomorphic. So I have to, had to find an isomorphic graph to G, which is shown above. So that's a little bit more difficult because finding isomorphisms of graphs, there's not a, an algorithm, algorithm for that. That's a, I believe that's a NP problem. So that's something you just have to do manually the long way. So you just have to start with the vertex, take a gander and start going down the list and seeing if it meets all the requirements. So mainly f uh, if two graphs are isomorphic, they have to have the same degree sequence, the same order, the same size. The orders of the degrees have to be the same. They have to have the same amount of edges, same amount of vertices. And if two vertices are next to each other, connected via an edge in our original graph, and they also have to be connected via an edge in our induced graph. That can be pretty time consuming, and there's no easy way to do that other than just trial and error. As you can see, I started to do it to the side, or no, that's actually for a different problem when I was determining eccentricities, but there's, there's no easy way to do that, unfortunately. And really with practice, is not gonna help you much, especially if you're given oddball types of graphs, because there, there are so many different kinds. Um, especially when we're talking about a graph of order one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's probably hundreds. I don't remember the, the algorithm for that, but there's a lot of graphs that can be made. So there's no easy way to do it other than guessing and checking. So I skipped it. And then we got what's the little delta of G. So that's the minimum uh, degree value found in the graph. Eccentricity is just another definition. So there's eccentricity of a couple different ones here. Then we have to find the center of G, which is just a list of vertices whose eccentricity is equal to the radius, and eccentricity is the longest path found from one vertex to another in a graph. And then we have the periphery of G, which is just the vertices whose eccentricity is equal to the diameter of the graph, which is the largest eccentricity value. Again, all of these except for that first one are just application of definitions, so not too bad. Part G, find a bridge. If you know what a bridge is, it's pretty straightforward. That's just an edge which, if it's removed, creates a disconnected graph so that you can't get from one vertex to every other vertex by an edge. We got number three, find the adjacency matrix of the following graph. 
So once I see the order provided, that's no big deal. Again, more or less just the application of a definition. So an adjacency matrix, so you have all the vertices in the columns and the same ones repeated in the row, they have to be in the same order. A one represents the fact that those two vertices, whichever uh, are in that row and column correspond to that. If there's a one, that means they're connected via an edge. If there's a zero, that means they are not uh, connected or adjacent or whatever vocabulary you use. So pretty straightforward. That's just plug and chug, write it out and then put a zero, look at the graph, one, zero, one, zero. Sometimes a pattern will emerge if you have a nice uh, complete graph. If not, sorry. Uh, number four, draw a graph on 10 vertices with diameter six and radius four. You only have to draw the picture, you don't need to explain yourself. Explaining isn't a big deal because all you would have to do is define what the eccentricity is and then the diameter and the radius. So that would take a little bit extra time but it doesn't take much more uh, really hard thought. But coming up with one can be a little bit challenging. Luckily we had a very similar one on a quiz and we talked about it so it wasn't too bad to just remember one that was very similar to that. I kind of just, as you can see, I only threw one on the page just kind of off to the side to be my, my first trial. And I counted them up and sure enough, it worked. I was like, cool. because so I know it was gonna be similar to something like a pentagon or a hexagon with a tail coming off the end. So having some prerequisite practice drawing those helped at least me a little bit and I think other people as well. But again, it goes back to knowing definitions of diameter, the diameter and the radius, which was addressed in the, you know, the first couple pages, so no big deal. So the next one is where we get to proofs. So suppose that for a uh, radius greater than or equal to one, G is a regular bipartite graph with apartheid sets X and Y, prove that the size of those partites are the same. So there's a lot of vocabulary in here. So knowing what R regular is and knowing what bipartite is. Bipartite is probably the most important part to that. Bipartite means that if a graph is cut into two parts, every vertex start in, starts in one part or one group and ends in the other one. You can see my logic here. What I usually like to do when I'm writing proofs is if I see a keyword like partite graph or R regular or these things for cardinality, I will write the definition of those things before I do anything else. Because I know that more often than not, actually always I'm gonna to need to know what those things are and if I'm doing a direct proof like this then it, it's really helpful and a lot of times that will give me uh, some good key ideas for starting my proof and getting the first couple steps because a lot of time that's the biggest struggle at least for me I think that's also the case for some other people that I talk to about it that's what my first line is the fact that G is bipartite implies every edge begins in X and ends in Y that's just a statement of fact that's a definition and I use that definition to make my next statement. So for every edge in the set of edges, two vertices are attached to it. Again, that's just a continuation of the definition. And if one of the vertices lies in one partition, then the other must lie in Y also by definition. So this is really just the application of definitions and building them off of each other. Uh, luckily, I had the option with this test to use any kind of proof I wanted, whether that was direct proof, contrapositive, counterexample, whatever else, induction. Um, so since I had the option, I steered clear of induction and did not use it at all because I hate induction and just generally it makes me uncomfortable. And uh, although I know it's valid, <laughs> but the, my professor likes a very particular type of induction proof for this class and I don't like it. I should be more comfortable with it because inherently there's gonna be some problem where I have to do it or it's gonna be a pain in the neck any other way, but I didn't have to, so I steered clear of it. A lot of these, I had a an exam review um, to go off of, so I knew basically some of the topics that were beyond it, and some of the proofs, well, I didn't know some of the proofs, I basically had a bank of proofs, so I could more or less memorize them, which I'm not good at, so I like to just do it from scratch. Back to this, I get got on a tangent there. I just followed it, there's a, a corresponding one in the other partition, so it must be that X and Y have the same number of vertices, which is what the cardinality is. And that's the end of the proof. And I guess he didn't like it that I didn't use the fact that uh, G was G regular. Perhaps that would have made it easier, but he didn't say my proof is wrong, but he still took a point off. I could probably argue it, not going to. Next one I skipped. And then I had number seven, which I believe was the last one that I did. Oh, nope. 
So prove that every closed walk of odd length in a graph G contains a cycle of odd length. This one is a little bit more intensive. So I started off with the definition of a closed walk and a closed cycle. A walk just being a sequence of vertices such that Vn and Vn plus one are connected by an edge or are an element of the edge set. I just wrote it in set notation. And a closed cycle is V1 in sequence V1 to Vk where V1 equals Vk, which is to say the first and last vertice is the same, so it starts where it ends and each vertex is distinct, so each one is only touched one time. And so I said, if a closed walk of odd length is a cycle, we're done, because it's true by definition. One, it's like rectangle and square type thing. And if a closed walk of odd length is also, uh, or sorry, so assume um, a closed walk W is distinct from a closed cycle. Uh, that means in W, a vertex must be repeated, repeated but does not necessarily have to be the starter end vertex. The repeated vertex must be the start end by definition of a cycle. So in order to start and end on the same vertex, the cycle must be of odd length. So I didn't totally hit that nail on the head, kind of miss. They gave me, it looks like six out of 10. Could have been a little bit more rigorous, kind of, kind of skipped around a little bit, but that's the way it goes. Way she goes, boys. That's the way she goes. That's the way she goes? Most of these are pretty straightforward. It's just like with a lot of proofs I've talked about before, it's knowing where you're starting and using every aspect of a definition or a theorem that you can refer to or a fact to get from one point to the next. You have to know what you can do to a graph, manipulate it, whether talking about bridges or vertex cut sets or cut vertices uh, like I did in here and what that does to a graph and what kind of conclusions you can draw based on doing that and how it affects other values for properties in the graph like little k of g or big delta g or eccentricity or the diameter or the radius or the periphery all of that stuff and lastly this was the easiest one and i chuckled because a friend and i were talking about it beforehand i was like i hope it's on there because it's a two-line proof i got full credit so prove that for every graph G, we have the sum of the degrees is exactly equal to two times the number of edges. And I basically just use the definition. So I said that by definition, every vertex is connected to another vertex via an edge. So for every two vertices, we have, we have one edge because we're not talking about multigraphs. We're not talking about hypergraphs. These are standard graphs. So if there's a vertex and another vertex and they're connected they're connected by exactly one edge so that means every time you count an edge there's going to be two distinct vertices associated with it so no matter what the value is for the total number of edges in your graph there's always going to be two times the number of vertices that number doubled for the the, the number of degrees two it was that one was two lines so I definitely need to work on my rigor and just practicing in general. That's always the case with me. Um, hopefully some of these problems and maybe some of my methods, obviously not all of them because I got a 74, not a hundred, were, were helpful or uh, you know illuminating in some way. If you guys like this one, I'll make one for my topology exam. In that one, I'm really only gonna be able to cover the problems, not really my answers because I got a freaking 38. So. Anyways, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.